Conjunctiva. Conjunctiva is epithelium covering of the eye and the inner side of the eyelid. What's the other name for the eyelid? Palpebra. Yes. Remember, the rule is every time you see two names or three names for the same structure, you have to know it. You have to. Otherwise, you will get the question wrong. So eyelid is also called palpebra, and the palpebra is basically two parts. Part of it that cover the white of your eye, covering the sclera, and then it will reflect and line in the palpebra. So there is two parts of the conjunctiva, which is this part here on the white, and this is called the ocular conjunctiva, and the other one that reflects on the eyelid from inside, that's called the palpebral conjunctiva. And the palpebral conjunctiva is basically, you see some, um, some people like to flip their eyelids. Did you see that before? Some people kind of crazy, <laughs> flip it. You see the red in the back? This is the conjunctiva. This is the palpebral conjunctiva, okay? So it should be lining from the back. It's not supposed to be ex exposed outside. Some people like to do that. But this is the palpebral conjunctiva. And the other one that actually cover the white is the conjunctiva. So if I touch my white that's clear right now, I'm not touching the clear. I'm actually touching the conjunctiva, which is a transparent layer that's covering the white. The white's underneath. Okay, there's no blood vessels in the white. What you see, red blood vessels, this is the conjunctiva. It's transparent, and that's why when you look at somebody's eye, you see the white. So you see this is a sclera. No, it's actually covered by the conjunctiva. So we have palpebral conjunctiva, we have ocular conjunctiva, and any abnormalities will be important. Any abnormalities. Okay, you see something like conjunctivitis, um, something like a cataract, a glaucoma. Anything abnormal is always important because it reflects your understanding of the subject. So conjunctivitis, itis, obviously inflammation or infection. So Conjunctivitis, which is called the pink eye, this is damage of the conjunctival surface. It can be inflammation. It can be infection. The second part is the cornea. And the cornea is that middle part, the transparent part. And you will see that in the lab today. So this is the transparent outer fibrous layer of the eye, which is this part here. Of course, it's not blue. It's transparent. And what you're seeing, the blue or green, blue, in, uh, in, inside, this is the color of the iris. The color of your eye is the color of your iris, right? You know that. Your eye is brown, it means your iris is brown, and so on. Now the lacrimal apparatus. What's a lacrimal apparatus? Lacrimal, lacrimation, it means tears. So lacrimal apparatus is the apparatus that produce, distribute, and drain the tears, which is the lacrimation. It will start from the lacrimal glands, this purple. It will go to the lacrimal ducts, pathing the eye, cleaning the eye, and then it will leave through one of those puncti, and puncti, punctum, means a very tiny hole, like you're having a pen or something and you pierce something, very tiny opening. And this is called the lacrimal puncti, superior and inferior lacrimal puncti. From those, from the lacrimal puncti, it, it will go to the uh, lacrimal sac, to the nasolacrimal duct, nasolacrimal. This is obviously a connection between the lacrimal sac and the nose. So we drain our tears in the nose. Yes. Did you ever... Um, if you are either um, crying, crying or um, if, if there is dust or something and you're tearing a lot, you feel something in your nose. Did you ever feel that before? You feel the tears in your nose? Usually what's happening is we we'll produce the tears or the lacrimation, the lacrimal fluid, start from the lacrimal glands, go through the lacrimal ducts, pathing the eye, cleaning the eye. It will leave through the superior and inferior puncti, punctum, puncti, to the sac, from the sac, from the, from the lacrimal sac, nasolacrimal duct, to the inferior meatus, 
and it's usually dripples and it goes really slow, small amounts. That's why we never feel it. You don't feel it, except if you're cheating too much, if you're crying or something. It will be too much. It will drain too much in your nose. So you can actually feel it in that case. And this pathway is important for lecture and lab. Starting from the lacrimal gland, going to the duct, going to the eye, to the puncti, to the canaliculi, to the, to the nasal, uh, to the lacrimal sac, to the nasal lacrimal duct, to the inferior concha. This is important. Both luxury and lab. So this is for the lacrimal apparatus. Reduce, distribute, and remove tears. The pocket where the palpebral and ocular conjunctiva meet is called the fornix. So it goes like this. This is the conjunctiva, the ocular, which is covering the eye. It will reflect like this and line the palpebra from, from inside. This pocket, the bending, this is called the fornix, which is this part here. Can you see this? The red, this is the ocular covering the eye, reflects, making a pocket, which is the fornix, and then it will line the eyelid, upper and lower eyelid. So this is called the fornix. The tears or the lacrimation itself is not only to clean, it's to moisturize the eye, to moisturize the eye, to moisturize the conjunctiva so it will not be dry. And also it contains some antibacterial and lysozymes and that's why it actually kills the bacteria, not only to clean it. So this is a composition of the tears. So the pathway, again, is important. The lacrimal uh, lake. One more time, lacrimal glands, lacrimal ducts, to the eye, to the inferior and super, superior and inferior puncti, to the canaliculi, to the lacrimal sac, nasal lacrimal duct, and then the opening will be in the middle and inferior meatus. So this is how it leaves the eye, or this is the pathway, and this is actually important. The pathway, yeah, it starts from the lacrimal gland, going to the lacrimal ducts, going to the eye, pathing the eye, cleaning the eye, it will leave through superior and inferior puncti to the superior and inferior canaliculi, okay, to the lacrimal sac, to the nasolacrimal duct, to the inferior meatus of the nose, okay? So this is a pathway and this is how it goes. Around the eye, there is the orbital fat. Actually, Every important structure in our body is surrounded by fat. Everything. If you look at the heart, the heart is surrounded by fat. The kidney is surrounded by fat. The liver is surrounded by fat. The eye is surrounded by fat. So there is fat everywhere. This is different from the subcutaneous fat that we try to get rid of. If we're gaining weight or something, this is different. This is a protective. This acts as a cushion to protect the eye to protect the kidney, to protect the important structures and to keep it in place, to act as a cushion. So when you move around, it does not hit like the bone or any solid structure around. So it will be protected. So this is called the orbital, the orbital fat. It acts as a cushion to support and stabilize and insulate the eye. The three layers of the eye. The eye is surrounded by three layers. The outermost, the middle, and the inner. The outermost is called fibrous. Fibrous tunic. Tunic means layer. Fibrous tunic. The middle layer is called vascular tunic. The inner one is called the neural tunic. Fibrous. Vascular neural. Fibrous. Vascular neural. The fibrous one, which is the tough one, it's fibrous tissue. This is the outermost one. And this will, will include the sclera, which is the white, and the cornea. The middle one, which is the vascular, and obviously vascular means it contains blood vessels. So the vascular tunic will be responsible for nourishing 
providing nutrition and oxygen to the, uh, to the different parts of the eye, and that's why it's in the middle, so it can feed the, the other parts. And this will consist of the choroid, which is the yellow, ciliary body, and the iris. You see the yellow in the middle? This one here. Of course, it doesn't look yellow in the, in the lab. It looks purple. So it can have any color, but it's in the middle one. So this, all of this is a choroid. And this part is the ciliary body. And then the iris. Those three parts together are called the vascular tunic or the middle tunic. The inner one is called the neural tunic, which is basically the retina. And the retina itself, which is the neural tunic, is two layers. You see red and pink, right? So it is actually two layers. One of them is pigmented, which is the outer one, and the, un the inner one is called the neural part, okay? So this is for the three layers. And the three layers are actually important for lecture and lab too. This is very important. And you can see different questions in the lecture and in the lab. Does the iris belong, belong to the outer or middle or inner? Okay, um, ciliary body. Is it part of the middle or the outer or the inner tunic and so on? So you can see questions like these. The other thing is, if you look at the cavity inside the eye, this is the lens. The lens is dividing the eye into parts, the cavity, smaller cavity anterior to the lens, and the large cavity posterior to the lens. The small cavity that's anterior to the lens is further subdivided by the iris into anterior chamber and posterior chamber. So, the lens is dividing the eye into anterior cavity, posterior cavity. Small anterior cavity, large posterior cavity, okay? The, the small anterior cavity is further subdivided by the iris into anterior chamber, posterior chamber. The anterior cavity is full of aqueous humor. Aqueous means watery. So this is the watery humor or the watery fluid that's maintaining the shape of this part. The posterior part will contain something else. It's, it's full of vitreous humor. Vitreous humor is something more thick, like jelly-like or jello-like structure. And both of those are keeping the eye in the spherical shape, and the anterior part is also, the anterior cavity, the aqueous humor, is also responsible for nourishment. It provides oxygen and nutrients to this anterior part. And obviously, what is this? What is this in between the, the eyes? Does anybody know? What is this opening here? The pupil, if you look at your iris, green, brown, whatever the color is, there is a circle, right? There is an opening. This opening is called the pupil, okay? So the pupil is actually communicating the anterior and the posterior chambers. Obviously, there is no communication between anterior cavity and posterior cavity. Are we getting this point? Lab and lecture. You can see that in your lab practical exam. You can see it in your lecture exam, okay? The cavities of the eye, the, the three tunics, the components, and the cavities and the subdivisions and the contents. This is very important, lecture and lab. I, I usually will repeat that in the lab, but I'm telling you from, from the beginning what's important for both of them, okay? And you will see toward the end of the, of the semester, you will see what I'm talking about. When you go to your exam, you will see that this accumulated together, that will give you the questions that you need to know. So we have outer fibrous, middle vascular, and inner, um, and inner neural. Anterior and posterior cavity, fibrous tunic. Which is a sclera and cornea. So those are the two parts. In between, it's called the limbus. So we have the sclera, the white, the cornea anteriorly, and this white that's separating the cornea from the clera is called the limbus, the borders. Sclera and cornea, and in between is the limbus. The next layer is called the vascular tunic, which is called the uvea, 
Uvia is another name for the vascular tunic. And uvia is not the same as choroid. I see that a lot. It's not the same. Uvia means vascular tunic. Does vascular tunic means choroid? It does not. It's choroid plus ciliary body plus iris. So uvia means the vascular, the whole tunic is called uvia. And it is three parts. If you put the three parts together, that will make the vascular tunic or the uvia. And obviously from the name vascular tunic, it, it provides vascular blood vessels. So obviously it will provide blood vessels, provide blood supply to the different components. This is one. The other thing is it is actually dark. The middle layer, because it contains blood supply, it's actually dark. Why is it dark? Because it's basically work like the camera. Do you know that the, the old-fashioned camera is exactly mimicking the eye? They got the eye, they, know, they understood how the eye works, and they did the cameras based on this. So the, the, the camera, the old-fashioned camera, is exactly like the eye. So if you remember in the, in the cameras, if you open the cameras, the film will, will be destroyed, right? If you, if you remember that, the old-fashioned cameras, if you open it, it will be destroyed. Why? Because you cannot expose it to the light. You have to have, and, and if you open it, you will see there is a dark layer inside to prevent any light from coming in. This is the choroid. So that the only light that reaches the inside of the eye, the only light that goes to the retina is the light that's coming from the cornea and from the iris. So that any stimulation, your eye will know exactly what's happening. If the, the choroid is not there, the light will be coming from different parts and you can be actually, your eye will be confused. And that's why it has to be dark. The vascular tunic also secrete and reabsorb aqueous humor that circulate in the, in the two chambers. So if you look at this again, this is the anterior chamber. This is the posterior chamber. Right here in the center body, this is where we make the aqueous humor, okay? So you need to know the aqueous humor. It's watery, that's number one. Number two, the function is to keep the structure, to keep the contour of the eye, of the cornea specifically in this part. It provides nutrients and you secrete it from this middle tunic, specifically from the ciliary body. Okay, so it will be secreted from here. It will go around providing nutrients, providing oxygen, taking away waste products and carbon dioxide. And then it's going to leave through something called canal of Schlem. Canal of Schlem. We will come to this point when you talk about glaucoma. Did you hear about glaucoma before? The blue eye, glaucoma, the tense eye. We will talk about this. But for now, this is what you need to know about the aqueous humor, okay? What's the function? Where is it secreted from? How do we um, release it or remove it out of the eye? So this is for the vascular tunic, and it contains three parts. Iris, choroid, ciliary body, and iris. The iris actually contain muscles, and that's why you change the diameter of the pupil. If you get like a source of light and focus it on somebody's eyes, you will see the pupil constricting or dilating. Does it constrict or dilate? If I have somebody here and I get a source of light and focus it on his eye, what will happen to his pupil? Constrict or dilate? It will constrict. Both eyes or one eye? Both eyes. This is called the consensual reflex. So if I do this, provide the source of light to the right eye, the iris will constrict? The pupil will constrict? In the right side, how about the left side? It will constrict too. Both of them. So this is called the direct reflex, and this is called the consensual reflex. Both of them will actually, and if that's not the case, there should be something abnormal. But this is a normal. So 
So this is a constriction and dilation. This will allow more or less light to enter the eye. So there is a constrictor that make the pupil um, smaller diameter, and there are the dilator muscles will enlarge the pupil. Which scenario do we constrict and dilate? If it is daytime, you constrict or dilate? Constrict. If it is nighttime, you dilate. If it is sympathetic, you constrict or dilate? Sympathetic, if you're frightened, if you're fighting somebody. Dilate? Yes. You dilate, you need to know how this person is going to hit you, right? <laughs> Where is it coming from? You have to dilate so you can see what's happening around you. If you constrict, something will come to you and you don't see it, so you have to dilate. Parasympathetic, constrict or dilate? Parasympathetic, constrict. Ciliary body is what contains the ciliary muscles, ciliary processes, and suspensory ligament will be attached to it. So this is the ciliary body. What are the components of the ciliary body? Ciliary muscles, ciliary processes, suspensory ligaments. And these are the suspensory ligaments right here. So this is the ciliary body. This, ciliary muscles, ciliary processes, and these are the suspensory ligaments. What's the function of the suspensory ligaments? Do you see the suspensory ligaments attached to what? What is this? The lens. So it's at the suspensory ligaments attached to the lens. Obviously, these suspensory ligaments, if they constrict, the eye will be like this. The lens, I'm sorry. And if it dilates, it will be like this. And this is going to change the refraction of the, of the lens. Refraction. Okay? So what's the function of the suspensory ligaments? If I ask you something like this, what's the function of the suspensory ligament? Change the shape of the lens. Okay? Changing accordingly, changing the refraction. It changed the, 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 uh, the shape of the lens, accord and, and according to that, depending on that, it will change the refraction. So if you are looking for something that's too close, you will need to dilate. You will need to relax the muscles so that the curvature will be like this. If you're looking something that's far away, your lens, the suspensory ligaments will contract and it will look like this. Okay? So the refraction will change depending on how far the object is. Are we following so far? Any question? So this is for the ciliary body. Choroid, most important thing is it's part of the vascular layer. So it provides nutrients, provide blood supply, nutrient and oxygen, and it is dark to allow for the retina to receive the light only from the iris or from the pupil. Neural tunic, which is the retina, this is the inner part, and this is what contain the visual receptors. So where is the location of the visual receptors, the photoreceptors? It's located in the retina, which is the neural tunic. Ciliary processes, we talked about those before. Here are the ciliary processes, this and this, together. Ciliary muscles, ciliary processes, and then the suspensory ligaments. So the, photo uh, the retina will contain the photoreceptors, and the photoreceptors are two types. We have two types of photoreceptors, rods and cons. And it is very important to remember the function of each one of those rods and cons. Rods are very sensitive, highly sensitive to light. So this is, we use it for night vision. Cons are for day vision and color. Okay? Two things about each one of those. Rods and cons. Rods. Nighttime and usually you see black and white. It's not colored. Cons are more for day vision, color. Did you get this? Rods, night, black and white. Cons, color, day. Okay? The cons specifically, which are responsible for day or night, day, color or black and white, color, 
There are a lot of these kinds specifically in, in parts that's called the fovea centralis. You will see it today. If you're Thursday, you saw that already. Do you remember this little spot? Do you guys remember that Thursday lab? No? Yes? Anything? Nothing? I will ask you about this Thursday. <laughs> fovea centralis. You will see something in the retina, a circle like this, and there is a dot exactly in the middle. This circle is called the macula densa. And exactly in the middle, this is the fovea centralis. The fovea centralis is full of cons. And this is where the, 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 the beam of light will be directed to. So the, the, the beam of light will enter from the pupil, cornea, pupil, and it will be all focused, trying to focus in the fovea centralis specifically. This is the most accurate point. This is the acute vision, okay? This is the most condensed part. So what do you need to know about the fovea centralis? It's in the middle of the macula densa. It's, it's, it, it is, it contains a lot of the highest amount of cons, it contains a lot of cons. That's number two. This is the center of refraction. You do the refraction specifically so that the light will be focused on the fovea centralis. This is your main point. And that's why if I'm looking at you, okay, I can see you very clear. I can see everything. But at the same time, I can see around a little bit, right? I can barely see. I cannot see everything the same clear clarity, right? So if I'm focusing here, this will go directly to the fovea centralis. I can see everything, the details. At the same time, I can see around a little bit. So around will not go to the fovea centralis. The acute vision, the most accurate is what falls on the fovea centralis, which is in at the center of the macula densa. And this will bring us to the visual axis. Look at the visual axis. When you see something, it will go like this, in the middle of the cornea, going through the anterior chamber, iris, posterior chamber, lens, and it will go all the way to the, what is this? What is this point here? Huh? Fovea centralis, yes. This is what you need to focus the light on. So this is the end of the visual axis. Fovea centralis, in the middle of the macula densa, the most sharp, acute. This is the end of the visual axis. Okay? You need to focus up everything to go to that. Fovea centralis, it contains a lot of cons. This is what you need to know about the fovea centralis, and this is important. And this is how it goes. The beam of light is going like this. The first refraction will occur through cornea, okay? And then it will go through the lens. The lens will do more refraction. So you want it at the end that is to be focused on the fovea centralis. This is the end of the visual axis. Are we following so far? Okay, so this is how the light enter and it should be focused on the fovea centralis. If it comes to other points, you can still see it but not, not as sharp, you can barely see something, okay? But this is how it will be focused. And if you're looking at something that's far away, I'm going to pull this, okay? So it will direct it to the fovea centralis. If you're looking at something that's close, very close, you will relax and it will be again focused on the fovea centralis. Some of us will have myobia and hypermetrobia. What's myobia? Myopia, near sight. And what's hypermetropia? Far sight. So what's happening on, in, in those two conditions? It is exactly what's happening. Your cornea, the curvature is a little bit different. So instead of being like this, it can be like this, or it can be like this, okay? Just I'm exaggerating, it's, it's very tiny. You cannot even see it except with um, uh, um, the stat uh, the uh, I mean the the, uh, the visual uh, instruments can show you that but you cannot see it but I'm just exa exaggerating to show you how it looks like instead of being like this it will be either more curvature or less curvature if it is more curvature the light will come here okay that's why you can't see 
instead of coming here, it will come here. If it is like this, if your cornea is like this, if you're hypermetro, it will go like this, behind, okay? So what's the near side, which is, a, which is myobia, versus the far side, which is hypermetrobia? It's the curvature of the cornea. In myobia, which is the near side, the point, the end of the visual axis, the point of focus will be anterior to the retina. Hypermetrobia, it will be posterior to the retina. And this is what your glass is doing. It's correcting this curvature so that instead of going like this to this point here, it will change somehow the refraction, the refraction, it will change it so that the light will come at the phobia centrals. And sometimes you're using a glasses and then it doesn't work anymore, right? A year or two and then it's, it's not comfortable. I can't see well, right? And you have to do, again, um, another examination, eye examination, and you can change the, 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 the glasses, right? You ever did that. What's happening here, the curvature can change with age. So maybe this is perfect for you right now, the, the, the glasses that you're wearing right now, and the curvature changed just a little bit. It's micrometers, by the way, it's not even millimeters, micro. But it does change the refraction, and if the, if the, the cornea, the, the, um, the curvature of the cornea, if it's changed, you will, you will, the refraction will change, and you will need to change your glasses. So we have rods and cons, and this is the first part. This will go to the bipolar cells. Okay, these are the bipolar cells are the neurons of the rods and cons, and they will synapse with the ganglion cells. Okay, so we have the rods and cons. The neurons from those will make the bipolar cells. The bipolar cells will go to the ganglion cells. Then you have horizontal cells. And emicrine cells. The, the horizontal cells and emicrine cells, the horizontal cells uh, in the outer part, and the emicrine cells, this is where the bipolar cell synapse with the ganglion cells. Okay, so cons and rods and cons. The neurons of those will make the bipolar cells and it will go to the ganglion cells, and then you have two types of cells, horizontal cells and emicrine cells. Those cells are going to, these are horizontal cells, they're going horizontally, and this will communicate between the photoreceptors and ganglion cells. They can facilitate or communicate, facilitate or uh, inhibit. Okay? Did you get that? You have rods. Have cons from which you would have this bipolar cells, and these are the ganglion cells. Okay, and you have cells like this that are going transverse, specifically here. This can either facilitate or inhibit. Okay, so okay. it's horizontal cells, these are horizontal cells that can facilitate or inhibit depending on the situation. Do you want it to see more? Do you want it to see less? Do you want it to focus more or less? This is just changing the communication. Stimulate, facilitate, or inhibit. These are the horizontal and amicrine cells. Optic disc. Uh, if you are Thursday lab, we saw the optic disc already, or you will see it today. If you're Tuesday, did you see the optic disc? Did you see the optic disc Thursday? Nobody from, from Thursday today? <laughs> or you don't remember? Yes, it is a blind spot. The optic disc is where all these fibers will merge and they will leave the eye through the optic disc. The importance of that, and this is very important, lecture and lab. What's the importance of the optic disc? The optic disc is also known as the blind spot. Why? Because no receptors. Does not contain receptors. This is where the fibers will exit and leave the eye. Okay, you can see that in your lecture and in your lab practical. Something like in your lab practical, for example. You see a sticker on the optic disc. What is this? And your answer is, you see a lot of answers, optic disc. Next question. Referring to the question 70 or question 60. This is also called blind spot. 
And it's called blind spot because it does not contain photoreceptors. Okay, this is important. Okay, we talked about this. So circulation of the aqueous humor, where do we secrete the aqueous humor from? Where is it secreted? It's secreted to the anterior and posterior chamber, but which part secreted? Ciliary body. It goes to anterior and posterior chambers. What do you call the anterior and posterior chambers together? Hmm? Anterior and posterior chambers. What do you call them together? Yes, anterior cavity. Anterior cavity. So the aqueous humor will be released from ciliary body. It circulates in both, both anterior and posterior chambers, which is the anterior cavity. And it will leave through canal of Schlem. Okay? The pressure of this aqueous humor that we're talking about, so the aqueous humor will be secreted into the anterior cavity, and then it will be absorbed from or out of the anterior cavity, right? You secrete it to the anterior cavity, and then you remove it from the anterior cavity. And this circulation is going around the, all the time, okay? You secrete from the ciliary body, aqueous humor go to the anterior cavity, and then it will leave through canal of Schlem. Go to the circulation, and then it will come back. Ciliary body, secreting the aqueous humor to the anterior cavity, will leave through the canal of Schlem. There is a pressure, a normal pressure, because of this circulation, which is the pressure of the aqueous humor inside the eye. This pressure is enough to keep the shape of the eye and maintain the continuous nutrients and oxygen going to the eye, okay? It should be enough. It should not be less pressure. It should not be more pressure. What if it is more pressure? What do you call this? Hmm? Glaucoma? Glaucoma. So what's glaucoma? Increase intraocular pressure. Aqueous humor. Increase the pressure of the aqueous humor. Increase the intraocular pressure due to increase aqueous humor. How can you increase the, pre the, the, um, the amount of aqueous humor? How can, you, how can you increase it? You secrete it and you get rid of it. Secrete it, reabsorb. It's a cycle that's going around all the time. You secrete from the cellular body and then you remove it from the canal snap, right? Input, output. There is a balance between those two. When do you think the aqueous humor will increase? The pressure increase, the amount increase. When? One out of the two. If you have a sink and you have a water pit and there is a drainage, how to get this sink full? One out of two things. Either open the tape all the way so the, the, the water entering the sink will be more than the water draining or block the drainage, right? How to get overflow of the sink? One out of those two scenarios. So how to get glaucoma, which is increase the pressure? One out of two. Either increase the secretion or decrease the reabsorption. Increase the secretion is extremely rare. To so increase the amount of aqueous humor secreted, maybe a tumor or something, but this is rare. Most of the time, what's really happening is the canal of Schlem is closed for some reason, or partially closed. Most of the time, it's partially closed. So normal amount of aqueous humor is entering, Less amount is leaving. So what happened to the aqueous humor? Accumulate. What happened to the pressure? Increase. What do you call this condition? Glaucoma. I'm telling you, any abnormality is important. Conjunctivitis. We talked about conjunctivitis. This is glaucoma. Myobia. Hypermetrobia. Okay? Can be more clear than this. I'm telling you. Any abnormality that reflects your understanding is important. Did you understand glaucoma? Any question? Okay, now the lens. 
The lens is obviously separating the anterior from the posterior cavity. Anterior to it, in the anterior cavity, what are the contents of the anterior cavity? Equus humor or vitreous humor? Equus humor. What's the contents of the posterior cavity? Vitreous humor. And that's why the posterior cavity is called the vitreous body. Okay? So the vitreous humor is also to stabilize the shape and support the retina. Did you ever hear, hear about retinal detachment? Did you hear about this before? Somebody got blind, lost their vision for some reason, and they told them you have retinal detachment. The retina is detached. What happened? The vitreous humor, which is filling the posterior cavity, it should keep the retina in place. It should keep the shape of the eye in the spherical shape. This, this is the vitreous humor. If something happened to the vitreous humor, if it shrink for some reason, the retina will detach. The retina will separate from the two layers, will separate from each other, and this is what's called the retinal detachment. So where is the vitreous humor? In the posterior cavity. The lens is transparent. Everything and the path of the light entering to the fovea centralis has to be either transparent or an opening. If anything interfere with that, that will be an abnormality. It can lead to blindness. So the cornea should be transparent, right? Are we following? The cornea is transparent. The anterior chamber, is it transparent? It has to be. Why? Because the aqueous humor filling the chamber is transparent. The iris or the pupil, is it transparent? The pupil, it's not transparent, it's an opening, right? Posterior chamber, is it transparent? Yes, it contains aqueous humor. The lens, is it transparent? Yes, it has to be. What if it's not? Cataract, cataract. What about the vitreous humor? Transparent. It's jello-like, still transparent. So everything in the pathway of the Visual axis has to be either transparent or an opening. Cornea transparent, anterior chamber transparent, pupil opening, posterior chamber transparent, lens transparent, vitreous humor transparent. Anything that interferes with this transparency will lead to some sort of blindness, whether complete or partial. So the most important thing to know about this is cataract. What's a cataract? Cloudness. Loss of transparency of the, the, the lens. What's a cataract? It's loss of transparency of the lens. There is some sort of uh, cataract that's called senile cataract, and this has almost happened to almost everybody. A lot of, a, a very high percentage. If you see your grandparents or something, you will notice that they have this white. Did you see that before? Some people having white inside their eye. Yeah, this is the cataract. It's very common. Senile specific, like in age of 70s, 80s or something, they usually come and they usually remove the eye. Previously, they used to just remove the lens. They remove the lens and you wear glasses. That will, um, will do the refraction that the lens used to do. Now, they, they do um, insertion of another lens, most of the time. Unless if the, this is somebody whose um, his health is not... Uh, good enough that you do surgery or something, just use glasses, okay? But it's very common situation, and again, it is loss of transparency. Loss of transparency. Cataract. Light refraction. We talked about this. Starting on the cornea, part of it will be through the cornea, and the next part will be through the lens. At the end, what is your goal? Where do you want to bring the light at the end? Where do you want to focus the light? Phobia centralis. And the phobia centralis is in the middle of? What is this? Mac macula densa. Macula densa. Phobia centralis at the center of the macula densa. What's stigmatism? Another condition. Stagmatism is distortion of the visual image because of wrong refraction of the cornea. 
basically, it's like this. Anybody have stigmatism? And usually, it usually goes with the myopia, by the way. If you have stigmatism, most of the time, not all the time. And what stigmatism is basically like this. If this is the normal curvature, this would be myopia, small curve, and this would be hypermetrobia, right? This is normal, myopia, hypermetrobia. Sometimes, you see something like this, with the myopia. I'm exaggerating. It's not exactly like this. Can you see this? It's not, it's not a, a very regular curve. It's a curve that goes like this and has some errors, okay, some irregularities. So this condition is both myopia and astigmatism. Did you get this? So what's astigmatism again? This is error of refraction due to irregularity of the cornea. A lot of people have both of them together. Usually astigmatism follow um, a myopia. So the, vision will, the visual image will be distorted due to error of the curvature of the cornea. Okay? You know how to tell if, you're, uh, if somebody's glasses are for myopia or hypermetrobia? Did you ever try that before? You, you can easily tell. If you have a paper like this, I can have any one of the glasses and I can tell you. If you have one of these, see this line? You have the glasses and you move it like this. If the line is moving with the glass, this is myopia. If the line is moving the other way, like you're moving down, you will see that the, 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 the line is like going up. Okay? So it's moved with the, with, the, with the glasses, this is myopia. It moves against the other way, this is hypermetrobia. If you tilt the, the, lens, the, the glass like this and the line is broken, this is astigmatism. So you can easily, yeah, it's a little trick that we, we used to do in medical school. Like we give each other glasses. Let me see yours. Can you tell me? This is, it's very simple. Just hold it uh, um, through a flat, through lines, and see what the line's moving. With the glasses, like you move it like this, goes up, goes down, myopia. If you move it down and the line goes up, this is hypermetrobia. If you tilt it and you see the line, it shouldn't. If you're looking at the line like this and the glasses you're doing this, the line stay the same. If the line started to move like this, this is astigmatism. Okay. Try it after the, after the lecture. <laughs> and it will work. If not, let me know. So this is astigmatism. Visual acu acuity, the acute vision is, the normal vision is 20 over 20. Okay? You stay 20 feet away from an object and you can see perfectly. You can see all of them, including the small one. Did you do visual test before? You can see the smallest at the uh, distance of 20 feet. You see 20 and 20. Scotomas. What's a scotomas? This is a normal blind spot. Basically, scotomas means if the light is entering through the cornea, it will pass through the retina, uh, through the lens, and it should go all the way to the PC chamber until it goes to the fovea. Some of us, if, if you ever have the eye floaters, does anybody have that? Like you see black things moving around, looks like, uh, uh, like a fly or something inside your eye, even, even though there's nothing, right? You see something black moving around. If you ever see something like that, this is scotomas, and it's basically, it's like something happened in the vitreous humor or something hanging here, okay? Degeneration, a problem happened in the vitreous humor, and usually, most of the time, not 100% of the time, it's permanent. So there, there is a part that you cannot actually see, which is called a scotomas. So what's a scotomas? It's a permanent abnormality, and it is a normal blind spot. Okay, so we talked about the rods and cons. What is this? What is this and what's, what's the purple and what's the yellow? The purple is? What does it look like? Con, yes, and what is this? The cons are responsible for? Color? Day. And the rods? Okay. When I repeat something, obviously you know that it's, it's important, right? Mm -hmm. Automatically. What time should we finish? 
Twelve thirty. Yeah. Oh, you want it to be twelve, right? It's twelve. <laughs> Visual pig, uh, pigments. We have diff we have pigments um, in, in our um, in our eye that help us to create the vision, and these are derivatives of rhodopsin. And what's a rhodopsin? It's opsin and retinal. What's a retinal? It's a derivative of vitamin A. Where do we get vitamin A from? Your grandma always tell you if you want you if you want your vision to be good, eat yes. carrot. Right? So vitamin A is in mainly in carrots and vegetables, but it's more in carrots. Why? Because carrots contain vitamin A. It's very rich in vitamin A. Vitamin A will make retinal, which part of the pigment, which is a redopsin, that will help us to see. Another abnormality is called the retinitis pigmentosa. This is inherited problem in the retina. Retinopathy. Retin. Pathy, retinopathy. What's pathy means? Disease, retina, retina. So this is a retinal disease. It's inherited. And what happened here is the visual receptors, visual receptors, the cons and rod, the visual receptors, deteriorate until it gets to blindness. Usually people with retinitis pigmentosa, unfortunately, it's very aggressive disease, and it will go all the way until you lose your visual receptors. This is retinitis pigmentosa. Bleaching is where rhodopsin molecule break down into retinal and opsin. This is bleaching. So you always break down the rhodopsin, which is a visual pigment, into those two components, and then it will reform again. So you go in a cycle of breaking down and reforming Redopsin. So when you when you break it down, this is called um, bleaching. Um, ninth blindness. This is a deficiency of vitamin A. I think we know about this, right? Mm -hmm. If you don't get enough vitamin A, you will get night blindness. So which which receptors are affected more by vitamin A? If that's the case, huh? The rods. Yes. So vitamin A is important for both of them, but it's more for the rods, and this will lead us to light blindness. We have a range between 400 wavelength until 700, which is between violet and red, and we should be, we should see in between those. But if somebody is having color blindness, color blindness is most of the time it's one color, but it can be more. I have color blindness. What is it? Red. I have green, I have blue, but sometimes it's green and red. So this is how to see. Can you all see this? Mm -hmm. If you can't see it, you have a problem with the red, and you can change it blue, green, and so on. So this is color blindness, and this is affecting more which receptors? Cons. Yes. During dark time or night time, you will be adapted by the visual receptors will be fully receptive. It will be more sensitive. Your, your, your visual pigments will be more sensitive during uh, dark time. So this is how you adapt to dark. And the other thing is, if it is dark, do you dilate or constrict your pupil? Dilate. Light adapted, if, you, if you're exposed to light, at the beginning you can't see much, and then you will get adapted, right? If it is dark at the beginning, you can't see. Stay for a few seconds or a minute or something, and you can still, and then you you can see, right? This is usually happen, right? When you turn on the light, all of a sudden you can't see, and then you will get adapted to it. When you go outside, it's dark. You can't see at the beginning, and then you start to see. This is called adaptation. So during light time, the pupil constrict and the pigments will bleach. During dark time, the pigments will become more sensitive, and the pupil will dilate. The visual pathway, we start from the photoreceptors to the bipolar cells, to the ganglion cells. And then you have two types of cells in between, that's called the M cells and the P cells. What's the importance of that? The, the M cells 
monitor the rods. The P cells monitor the cons, and this is the most important thing to know in this, in this part. We have the M cells and we have the P cells. What the M cells? They monitor the rods. What are the P cells? They monitor the cons. This is the entire visual pathway. It starts from here. And you need to understand this, lab and lecture. You start here, the light enter, cornea, anterior chamber, pupil, posterior chamber, and then it goes through the lens, vitreous humor, which is the posterior, until it goes to the fovea centralis. At this point, you make the optic nerve. The optic nerve will carry the vision right and left, and then they will intersect. Do you remember the optic nerve, optic chasm, optic tract from AP1? Do you still remember? That's good. <laughs> I thought it's gone. It's usually the, the previous semesters always disappear, but you have the optic nerve and then will intersect partially, and then you have the optic tract to the lateral geniculate body, from the lateral geniculate body to the projection of the optic radiation, and it will end at what? Which part of your brain? The visual cortex? What, where is the visual cortex? Here or here or here or here? Where? Where's your visual cortex? Huh? The back one? Yes. Occipital. Yes. Yes. It will end at the occipital. This pathway is important. Okay? Start from the eye, rods and cons, to the ganglion cells, to the bipolar cells, to the ganglion cells, optic nerve, optic chasm, optic tract, lateral geniculate body, optic radiation, visual area, which is in the occipital lobe. This is a visual pathway that we need to know. And this is how it goes. Depth perception. How do we perceive the depth? Why we see somebody in 3D? How do we see the depth? The depth is comparing positions from right and left eye. So the right eye is, is um, providing you with information, visual information. The left is doing the same thing. When you compare those together, you will get the depth. That's why if you look on one eye, it will become less depth. You can see still, but it's not as sharp as when you see with uh, the two eyes. Uh, the circadian rhythm is changing with the day and night cycle. Okay, and we'll stop here.